Bear with me. Good afternoon, everyone. I am introducing Gabe McKinnon today. He's a history major here at Northwest Missouri State University. He's in his senior year and he's from New Springs, Missouri. Good. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. I'd like to begin by thanking Lauren for the introduction, as well as Dr. Ford for her input while I read this paper. Uh, she very graciously listened to all of my very bad ideas. And I came to something hopefully uh, presentable here. Uh, and I'd like to begin by providing. Uh, oh, it's one of those. I'd like to begin by providing a bit of an outline of what we're going to be going over today. Uh, we will start by looking at the student organization efforts on the campus of Kent State University uh, in Ohio during the, the lead up to the Kent State shooting in 1970. Uh, we will then transition to uh, the organization efforts or the resistance efforts, I should say, of Black students at Jackson State College coming out of the Black Power and the Black Liberation movements in the late 1960s. And we will then be looking at uh, the historical narratives that have uh, arisen. Uh, with regards to those two events in the decades that followed, um, including this uh, sort of Kent State II idea that was popularized uh, with Jackson State, uh, with the Jackson State shooting existing in the, the shadow of its predecessor. Uh, but before we go any further, I'd like to circle back to this idea here under uh, the Kent State slide, this idea of the, the movement. Because when we're talking about uh, Kent State in the 1960s, we're not just talking about uh, Vietnam protests uh, in a vacuum. Uh, the period's anti-war sentiments, both at the time uh, and within the popular consciousness afterwards, were informed by and deeply connected to a broader spirit of social activism and countercultural sentiments informed by uh, left -wing the left-wing political climate at the time. Uh, this creates something that's uh, sort of nebulous and intangible. It's a connection of organizations, activists, artists, and, and everyday citizens bonded together in what uh, historian and sociologist Terry Anderson has dubbed the movement. Now, I like this terminology because it's kind of uh, intentionally broad and, and sort of a catch-all. And it links together the sort of spirit of the 60s as it exists uh, in the collective consciousness. You know, everybody from, from Bob Dylan to Tom Hayes, Huey Newton to the glorious time. All right, so student activism uh, at Kent State, in order to fully uh, get into this, we need to talk about the background of the student population uh, at Kent State University. These were largely students coming out of uh, the working class. These were students who couldn't afford to go to Carnegie Mellon or you know, the University of Pennsylvania or, or Ohio State. Uh, a lot of them received uh, tuition through the GI Bill or and following the, the immediate post-war period, their children uh, benefited from this as well. And I think the statistic that I found really striking in researching this is that 57% of the student body uh, was not just from working class backgrounds, but was from working class backgrounds immediately in uh, the Cleveland area. I'll go back to the slide, but just so you get a sense of the geography, there's Kent, there's Cleveland, there's a lot of these sort of industrial suburbs of, of Cleveland, Youngstown, Akron, etc. Uh, and because of this, this working class background, a lot of them brought the sort of politics of their parents, the, the old left, uh, as it were. These were people who idolized, you know, FDR and the New Deal, we did labor unions. Uh, and a lot of this is also connected, in, particularly in the early 60s, to the, the civil rights movement of the time. You have the Kent Council on Human Rights, which began in the early 1960s. You have a series of uh, sit-ins protesting uh, housing inequality for, for Black students at Kent State uh, in 1961. And George Bowman, who was the president of Kent State, uh, who was not uh, progressive or, or certainly did not approve of these, these sort of uh, sit-ins, uh, but he will, he will bend, he, he will give in, and he will uh, concede um, uh, to their demands and, and uh, allow for, for equal housing for black students. And this uh, further motivates the student activists uh, going forward. This will transition uh, in the mid 60s. We see an increased radicalization of student activists uh, on the campus of Kent State University, sort of the old to the new left. A lot of this was inspired by, by sort of Marxist ideology, but all of it uh, was dedicated to, to things like, like social justice. Um, 1965, you have the establishment of the Committee to End the War in Vietnam. So again, sort of uh, transitioning from this focus on like civil rights to, to more direct uh, focus on the Vietnam War. Um, the establishment of the Committee to End the War in Vietnam 
as well as um, national organizations with those chapters uh, on the campus of Kent State, the NCC, the National Coordinating Committee, as well as the Students for a Democratic Society, and the STX. Uh, which brings us to the spring of 1970, which is really where things begin to hit sort of a, a fever pitch. You have Jerry Rubin, uh, known for his role uh, in the trial of the Chicago 7, will do uh, give a speech to give a demonstration on campus, which will obviously you know, really frustrate uh, Bowen and, and the administration. But uh, during this time, we also see the sort of disconnect between the administration of Kent State uh, and the government of Ohio as well. Uh, disconnect between that and the sort of people on the ground, the students and the faculty at Kent State. Uh, the Kent State Daily Statter, which was the one kind of an odd name for newspaper, uh, but two was the, the student newspaper on campus, which has actually been documented uh, or reported very well. I will publish a poll finding that uh, seven to one opposition against the war is the. Uh, Um, and then in uh, May of 1970, this is when obviously things, things come to a head. Uh, Nixon's Cambodia campaign, the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. Uh, May 1st, we see the first um, protests against the Vietnam War expansion in Cambodia. Uh, May 2nd, students burned down the ROTC building, sort of a, an act of resistance against uh, military presence on campus. May 3rd, Governor Jim Rhodes pictured uh, up there at the top will arrive in Kent along with the National Guard. And then, as we'd expect, bringing in a bunch of uh, National Guard, National Guardsmen campus, this will only heighten tensions further. And then on May 4th, uh, National Guardsmen will open fire on a, camp, on a crowd of uh, anti-Vietnam War protesters, four wounded uh, and nine were killed. And to get a sense of sort of the, the government and the administration's uh, perspective or, or attitude towards these campus organizations and campus protests. Uh, I provided a quote here. Uh, I'll let you read it, you know, on your own line. So he's not great. Uh, and this is this has been very dark so far. It, it's going to get worse. So for kind of a brief moment of levity, I would like to turn your attention down to the last line of that quote here. And I would like to you to really think about what an asinine thing that is to say in the United States of America, a country founded on violent military revolution. Uh, in order to talk about the Jackson State shooting, on the other hand, we need to talk about racism, specifically white supremacy and Mississippi. Even amongst uh, the Jim Crow and the immediate uh, post-Jim Crow South, uh, Mississippi was recognized as being particularly racist. And I think this quote here from Roy Wilkins, who was the uh, director of the NAACP at the time, uh, really sums that up uh, very well. There's no state with a record which approaches Mississippi in humanity, in inhumanity, murder, brutality, and racial hatred. And as far as Jackson, Mississippi is concerned, things also are not great. Uh, in 1961, you have 300 freedom riders who were arrested in Jackson after they got off the bus. And in 1963, you have the assassination of Medgar Evers, who was a prominent civil rights activist, um, in the driveway of his house. On, on a side note, it will take 31 years for the uh, assassin of Medgar Evers to get convicted. Mississippi. So, yeah. Uh, also at the time, the late 60s uh, into the early 70s, you see the development of uh, the Black Power Movement, which is a sort of more militarized form uh, of the civil rights movement, focused on uh, racial pride and the creation of black institutions. We'll get to that more in a second. Uh, an emphasis on direct action, uh, self-policing, uh, the arming of black communities. Uh, the, the phrase Black Power was coined by Kwame Tur in uh, 19, uh, 1966 in Greenland, Mississippi. You can see the sort of geography there, Greenwood, pretty close to Jackson. And, yeah. uh, and here is a quote from, from uh, the speech. So I will give you again another second to read that.
temporary pedigree with um, and so this idea of sort of um, inherently black institutions or development uh, of black institutions will extend to Jackson State College as well as other HBCUs. There's this idea that uh, these were supposed to serve as sort of idyllic black universities. Uh, and a lot of this has to do um, with the administration of John Peoples, who was progressive uh, by Mississippi standards. I don't want to overstate it. But he will institute classes uh, about African-American history and culture civil rights. So we see that sort of development of the black university uh, during this period as well. Uh, but I, again, this is sort of uh, a, a difficult thing and I don't want to overstate because there is a lack of sort of formal political uh, organization on campus, which is sort of a, sort of a contrast between the Jackson State uh, shooting and the Kent State shooting, where we see a lot of um, very direct political organization political groups like uh, SDS and the Kent State uh, Committee to End Vietnam. Uh, instead, in order to get an idea of the sort of resistance to the white supremacy of Mississippi, we need to look uh, not necessarily at organized, explicitly political uh, resistance. We need to look at sort of everyday forms of resistance. And I, I'll read you an excerpt here from uh, Robin Kelly's paper, We Are Not What We Seen, which is about uh, black resistance in the Jim Crow South. For daily and organized, the base of seemingly spontaneous acts of resistance form an important yet often neglected part of African American history. What we are looking at here is the ways in which the students at Jackson State College wanted to carve out uh, spaces for themselves and for their community within the sort of within the racism of, of Mississippi. Which brings us uh, to Lynch Street. Uh, Lynch Street's the main road that. Uh, uh, goes through the campus of Jackson State College. And over the years, this has seen uh, a number of uh, sort of altercations or, or violence between students and white motorists who would pass the campus, normally shouting some sort of racial slur or trying to vandalize students' cars. Um, so notably, in 1968, you will see uh, sort of an outburst of violence on Lynch Street following the assassination of Martin Luther King. And again, I think this gets back to that idea of sort of everyday, not necessarily organized forms of resistance um, to sort of repressive political climates. You know, this was an effort by students to carve out the black university, the black space within uh, Mississippi. Uh, and then in May of 1970, similar to what we see uh, at Kent State, things will sort of reach a fever pitch. On May 13th, uh, there is a, a an altercation involving a white motors trying to vandalize a student's car, which will lead to the rock throwing, bottle throwing uh, between um, students and, and motorists. This is when the highway patrol first gets uh, called into campus. Uh, May 14th, I should have put this up there. May 14th, things will, will get worse. There's a rumor that spread around campus that Charlie Evers, the brother of Medgar Evers, had been assassinated. It sort of continued to heighten tensions. Uh, and then on May 15th, the evening of May 15th, uh, things will escalate even further, leading to the, the ultimate uh, Jackson State shooting. Uh, students uh, commandeer a dump truck and try to block traffic, preventing motors from, from passing through campus, preventing the National Guard from getting to campus. Um, and it's at this point, they eventually set the dump truck on fire. Uh, at this point, the, the Mississippi Highway Patrol is sent in with orders, as you can see there, to clear the streets. And restore order. They will converge on Alexandra Hall, which is a woman's dormitory on the campus of Jackson State. Uh, a bottle is thrown out of one of the buildings of, of uh, Alexandra Hall, and the Mississippi Highway Patrol will open fire uh, on the building, shooting indiscriminately. Two people are killed and 12 are injured. Go ahead. In the aftermath, at both Kent, uh, in both Kent, Ohio, and Jackson, Mississippi, we spread right. We see widespread backlash among the townspeople, not against the uh, the National Guard or against the Mississippi Highway Patrol, but against the protesters and the victims. Uh, in Kent, uh, the New York Times will publish a, an article um, highlighting um, the townspeople's support for the National Guardsmen who, who opened fire on the anti-war protesters. Jim Rhodes, if you will remember him from earlier, uh, will give us a release statement saying, uh, days of go easy uh, policy towards campus lawbreakers is, is over. Uh, down in Jackson, the Jackson Clarion Register, which is the uh, newspaper down there in Jackson, uh, they will put out an article calling for the 
law-abiding citizens of our state to speak out in defense of our law enforcement officers and a, a shocking one-sentence op-ed offering party congratulations to the Mississippi State Police. As uh, for the, the national sort of perception of the events, this is where we really begin to see the sort of linkage of these two events within the popular consciousness. As I mentioned at the front, Time Magazine will dub it a literal Kent State Part Two, and this is largely how it's been remembered, firmly in the shadow of its predecessor. There is also this uh, narrative that develops, around, that develops around the time, Time Magazine is guilty of this as well, of associating the Jackson uh, state shooting with anti-war, anti-Vietnam War protests. Um, and, you know, why is this? Why have we remembered these two events the way we have? Why is Jackson State remembered as being sort of in the shadow of, of, of the Kent State shooting? And I think there's a couple different reasons. Um, one, the timeline, Kent State obviously did happen 11 days prior. Two, sort of this uh, already pre-established media narratives regarding uh, Vietnam and the counterculture, the movement, as we discussed uh, earlier. The, the public and the media were so were so focused on Vietnam uh, and the expansion of Vietnam, the Cambodian campaign, that, that these sort of events get kind of folded into that, that coverage. Uh, and particularly in the decades that follow, I think that pop culture plays um, a big part of this, you know, we, we think about the movement in the 60s, it's very much something that exists within sort of our collective consciousness today. I am, you know, guilty of this to a certain extent, the title of this presentation, I hear the drumming, is taken from the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song, Ohio, about, about the Kent State shooting. So, so this sort of romanticization, 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 of uh, the movement and the 60s has played a, an important role um, in how these things are remembered afterwards. But the biggest reason, as I'm sure you all can guess, go ahead, this thing, is just plain old racism in my estimation. I, I shouldn't need to tell you, and I hope that we all can agree, that there are very clear reasons as to why images like that receive more traction received more attention, both positive and negative, both in the time and in the decades that followed, at the expense of images like this. And ultimately, this is the big conclusion that I have drawn from writing this paper uh, and, and going through this, this project. It is the need for accuracy when we tell these stories, and it is the need for equal footing of these events. These tragedies did not occur by accident, nor were they part of some sort of mythic or more romantic period of history. They were the result of resistance, both organized and otherwise, to repressive political climates. And the best way to study the Kent State and Jackson State shootings, indeed the best way to honor those who were killed, is to examine these organizational efforts and the brutality of the violence inflicted upon them, as well as the widespread political and public response. However, this in and of itself is not enough. If we fail to place these events on equal footing, we fail to look at them as historical events worthy of individual study, and we contribute to another sad example of transgressions against white Americans overshadowing transgressions against other racial groups in this country. That's all I got. Thanks. Questions? Yeah, questions. Go ahead. I must have covered it. <laughs> Yeah, what was there any as you did your research was there anything that you found like surprisingly difficult to research uh in what regard like uh like i read i thought oh this is awful or like what was it hard to like find sources for you can take the question however you want <laughs> okay uh well reading the stuff from governor jim rhodes about you know how this is the most violent military group ever assembled on american soil that was pretty tough to read as well as obviously all of the is this the racist stuff that was published in those Jackson newspapers. Uh, as far as um, the logistics of, of researching this, um, both the, the Kent State Statter, again, it's a weird name for newspaper, and the, the newspaper down in Jackson are actually very well documented. Like we have a lot of those things just available online. Um, I guess sort of the most difficult thing logistically um, was trying to connect these events um, to broader social movements and sort of word them in a way that, that you know, is finding the right word. 
with regards to connecting these events to the broader social movements, which is why I thought that uh, that term, the movement, was just so effective. As I recall, at least one of the people in Kent State was was not part of the protest, and they all were part of the protest. The ones that were killed. I think, yeah, the ones that were killed were part of the protest. I think it can state like there was someone who was on their way to class. At least one person. Yeah. So it was just like, well, at least that's how it was reported. I don't know. Really. But like, they were so bystanders. Like, and that was kind of the, what was the situation for Jackson State? Was it people who were just like inside of the dorm? It was just people who were in the dorm. dorm. Uh, the Power Patrol just surrounded the dorm and a bottle was thrown from one of the buildings and they just opened fire and shot into the building. And did you have, I feel like in your paper, I don't remember, um, had you included like how many like shots they fired or at least how many times it hit the building? Because of course you can see a, Massive amount when you're looking at the images that you included. I don't know how many times uh, the was hit. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Anything else? Yeah, sounds like normal. So, I think it, made, it was a really interesting presentation and the comparison of them, but with your conclusion that. These events should be treated, you know, on equal footing. Um, would you go back and do it differently? Is there any part of you that um, I don't know where this from, but like you still have to play on this. Like Kent State is really famous, and yes. Kent State in its shadow. Um, is there part of you that would want to write another paper and just focus on on Jackson State or like, yes. somebody else should? <laughs> And Dr. Ford's uh, 20th century, 1945. Mm -hmm. Since 1945, uh, we received a, a list of one, a list of sort of protests. And they were grouped together. Kent State and Jackson State were uh, grouped together when they were assigned to be. It's a bit of a grievance I have with you. Did <laughs> uh, not make this sorry. better. An mm -hmm. interesting statement. Interesting paper. Um, yes. Yes. You had to tackle the harder one first and before that. you know, before you knew that you wanted to go in and do the second follow up, yes. the more detailed one. Uh, if I were to do it again, I would be more interested in, in looking specifically at Jackson State. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you did a great job with the PowerPoint. Thank you. So good information, but good like detail and imagery and everything in your PowerPoint. So, it all looks really nice. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you for letting me.